So this is the um, schematic of the oxyfuel uh, that I took from Vattenfall's um, Vattenfall's um, brochure a long time ago, more than 10 years ago now. Vattenfall is the one of the largest utilities uh, in um, Europe. They own many, many power stations. And they were the strongest proponent of oxyfuel. So they actually built uh, drying, pro they funded drying projects, they funded oxyfuel program, they actually ran it. So this is their concept. And of course, this is for lignite. Um, uh, the German lignites are about 50% moisture containing uh, coal. And um, so the, and here they did, they did it very nicely. Uh, the, this is the color coding for the validation status at that time. Whatever is green it means fully validated. So no need for any engineering development. And uh, this is partially delivered, the bluish, and the red bits are um, uh, not validated. And um, here, this is the boiler, the standard two-pass boiler. Schematically, it is shown um, the uh, burners there. This is the furnace zones, and then the second pass, then the um, um, ash hoppers, the ESPs, etc then the sulfur removal, then the cooler and the condensers, and eventually the CO2 goes which, uh, for compression, etc. So what they identified was that, that fuel preparation and fuel preparation is fully known. Lignite drying was developing at the time. Now it is known, it's not a problem, ASU. They went for the standard ASU, so that's also known. This is the major unknown. What will happen under oxy combustion case inside the boiler? Then the flue gas and oxygen mixing, that's also partially uh, unknown. And this is partially known, flue gas treatment and cooling. And the most important thing is the overall overall uh, integration, process integration, that was not known. And if you can see in their schematic where they are taking the, uh, the recycled flue gas, they're taking the particle-free recycled flue gas. So this is wet particle-free recycling, flue gas recycling. So so I just copied it because it, it, it has got so much meaning when it comes from a different company. And this is a text deliberately I kept um, uh, fully copied. And they had, um, I've acknowledged right on page one. The goal, what is the goal uh, of uh, objective view of flue gas recirculation? So limit the combustion temperatures to values similar to those in combustion with air so that you are not looking at completely new boiler development. Cool flue gas is extracted in the three ways that we have shown in one of the previous slides. Depending on the fuel and the temperature of the recirculated flue gas, differing but high volumetric flow rates are needed to reduce the combustion temperature. So depending on the type of the coal, sometimes you may need to recycle a fair bit 60-70% of the gas that you need to recycle, it means it's recycled. So in steady state, whatever still coal, whatever coal goes in, corresponding amount of um, CO2 and water vapor still goes out. But the recycling part simply keeps on concentrating. Um, about two-thirds of the flue gas produced in the steam generator has to be recirculated to achieve temperature similar to air combustion. So that is the rule of thumb. One is that the question that was asked, what is the oxygen content overall? About 32%, one third of 100%. Um, and then recirculation could be, um, uh, could be um, two third of the flue gas that is generated may have to be recirculated. Why? To achieve temperatures similar to air combustion. That's the point. 
The high volumetric flow that needs to be transported involves an increase in the dimensions of the plant and the auxiliary power requirement for the recirculation fan, which means the, if you are recirculating 67% of the flue gas, then you will have to cool it before you can pump it, uh, fan it back in again. So you are looking at um, high aux auxiliary, additional auxiliary power consumption. External recirculation is an established technology, but one that entails a number of problems like the construction size, wear and tear, corrosion, when temperatures fall below the dew point, distribution of the individual flows. So this is a question that was asked, that can I put it here, stage it in this way, that way? That's something that people were trying to learn from those 30 megawatt uh, demonstration units. Uh, but the important thing is, that the flue gas has its own dew point. And as you are concentrating it, um, as you are recirculating it, you are essentially, to some extent, you are also concentrating the um, acid, acidic gases. And below a, below, uh, beyond a certain number of times of recirculation, they can become uh, quite strong in composition of the acidic compounds and therefore dew point may be quite low, become quite low. So just imagine all the fan, the blades, the instrumentation, etc. all will be subjected to now the um, uh, corrosive gases. That has also been tried. So, so there has been parts taken, taken from here. Parts taken from here, and uh, you know, um, and then release it. Similar to uh, the um, the um, makeups that happen, they do from time to time you deliberately lose something or something is lost from the system, you make it up with the fresh ones. So it, that it does. But the important point is that you, there is a potential to build up. Uh, and uh, to the possibility, uh, owing to the possibility of the retrofitting existing power stations with it, recirculation is a solution at the logical beginning of the realization of the CO2 emission free plant. So this is not my statement, I have copied it. So that's the external recirculation, but then there was a, um, there was a talk of recircula internally recirculating um, the, the flue gases, because in the PFI boilers, air or oxygen, uh, you can have temperature, different temperatures. It's not that everywhere it is 13, 1400 degrees Celsius. So there was a talk, discussions of internally recirculating by bringing in baffles and then recirculating it uh, internally. But then uh, I never saw uh, any um, serious attempts of internal recirculation, really. It's still predominantly uh, external recirculation that have been applied in different plants. Can be, can be. Yeah. So, um, so um, particularly if you are recirculating the fluid, fluid sorry, the fuel gas uh, with particles in it, that means before the ESP, then fouling will be an issue, and then uh, quite an issue. Um, so that's why um, uh, after the ESP, that's what was eventually accepted as the norm. Um, so people tried all sorts of things. Of course, it will be easier to do it. Um, uh, the initial thoughts was that it will be easier to recirculate um, the gas before the ESP. 
but then the fouling of the heat exchangers in the cooling uh, cool, cooling exchangers, they eventually found that it's much better to have it that way. So that that also has an effect of the effect on the recycle ratio, as you would expect if you um, recycle it after the ESP, which will be slightly cooler. There, the um, the um, uh, the uh, uh, the temperature will be slightly lower, and therefore you'll have to recycle less. So depending on where you are recycling from, your recycle ratio can change. So what they do is um, they actually find out the extent of the problem and you know how quickly it is fouling or how long does it take before the fouling becomes unmanageable. So all the operation, operational lessons are learned and then that is put back in the operating regime. That's how it is done. So it is about cleaning the heat exchanger tube of particles is an established procedure. It's all parched with gases, uh, usually not with liquids, not with water. With gases, they will simply clean them. So this will not be an issue uh, going forward, really. I have never seen that being uh, identified as an issue. So. The other bit is this title is title of this slide is effect on the flue gas composition. Obviously, uh, because you now have a substantial amount of CO2 and water vapor, which is about two thirds of uh, the uh, total gas that will uh, have a composition effect on the overall composition. Anyway, the density of the flue gas from the oxy coal process. This is the most important thing. Is greater because you now have carbon dioxide. Um, rather than nitrogen, which is 28. Uh, and weight flue gas recirculation, the lower molecular weight of water can partly compensate the effect of CO2. So uh, what we, uh, people try to mean in here is that in air fire, it's all um, uh, 28. In here, it's majority 44, uh, uh, but there is also some at 18, so depending on how much water vapor you, you are recirculating as part of the recycled flue gas, that will bring it below the, um, uh, closer to 28. The reason is that if the gas is heavier, then you will be, uh, you'll be requiring a lot more pumping power, fan power, I mean, to recycle it. And uh, everything boils down to eventually to economics. So the auxiliary power consumption, and as much as you can reduce, the better it is. Um, and then, of course, the last bullet point is that due to the high specific thermal capacity of water vapor, the effect is more pronounced on wet flue gas. So if you are doing the wet flue gas recycling, then you will see more effect on the heat transfer and therefore on the um, flow gas composition overall. So these are some of the issues I thought you would need it, um, uh, better to bring it to your attention. There are, of course, other second, third degree um, issues that you need to be aware of. But these, I thought, are the most important ones because these are the ones which you use for design purposes, design of the model. Say, say, say again.
Yeah. True. So, so in here, um, uh, staying on the theme of effect on uh, flue gas composition, the first column shows you the typical gas composition in the, of the flue gas in air boilers, air fired, uh, air, you know, coal fired boilers operating in the air. Um, and the oxy coal combustion is, um, if it is dry recycling, then this is what it is, CO2 about 87%. If it is weight recycling, then it is 74%. Rest is water vapor, and it's a significant amount of water vapor. 22% steam uh, um, is a significant quantity for gasification. Then um, the important thing is to know the difference of these two, the density. So you are essentially, you are looking at, you know, 25 percent increase in the um, density straight away. So it's a huge increase in the pumping power. And of course, the overall molecular weight of the gas will, be, will also be different. So these are some of the um, factors that um, the designers take into account. And then that will then uh, have an effect on the heat transfer for an oxy coal firing system designed to use the same temperatures as air. The volumetric flow rate flows in the furnace are about 35% lower, um, simply because the gas is denser. The corresponding mass flow is 18% lower, and the oxygen content of oxidizing agent is about 32 volume percent, which we mentioned before. Due to the lower volumetric flow rate, the cross-section of an oxy fuel boiler needs to be reduced from air firing sizes in order to induce velocities similar to those in air combustion, which produce a good heat transfer coefficient in the convective heat transfer region. So what it means is that if you are building a new boiler completely from a, an, at a greenfield site or completely replace, replacing the air fire boiler, with a new oxy fuel boiler, then it's not a problem. But if you are keeping everything and then you are adjusting the, the capacity of the existing boiler, which is air fire, then you have to be mindful of all of these issues. So that it, you somehow, you need to reduce the, the volume, uh, uh, the cross section that are available. So, and then, so that's a question for the question for the uh, designers: how you can um, reduce that volume uh, or that cross section. Uh, the only way that you can do is uh, bringing in more baffles so, or um, bringing in more dummy tubes. But then again, bringing in dummy tubes is not easy. The huh? Modified surfaces can be used theoretically, yes. Um, depends on what you mean by modification, though. Mm. Modifying the existing tubes will be very difficult. Big, um, but uh, bringing in additional tubes will be easier. So uh, you can bring in additional tubes with their own headers, etc., and um, taking into, taking in, um, uh, uh, maintaining them through additional um, steam generation uh, surfaces, that's possible. Whether that will match with the overall heat that is now generated, that's a different thing. So it's a bit of a delicate balance that one needs to strike um, uh, as to um, what, um, uh, how far, how far an existing boiler can actually be modified. And you may find that an existing boiler cannot be modified at all. Okay. So 
but it is um, uh, in general this is the this is the statement that I like. The both radiative and the convective heat transfers uh, will improve under the oxyfuel conditions, and we will see that later. The increased concentrations of uh, CO2 and uh, steam or water vapor will improve the radiation heat transfer because simply because it will increase the emissivity. What do you think? Because in an existing boiler, there is very little scope for what modification you can do. Usually in existing boilers, what happens is every one, two years, this, this tube, that tube, etc., they leak. And uh, during the scheduled outage, every whatever, every 8,000 hours or 16,000 hours, uh, they are entirely cooled down. And then people, welders go in inside the furnace and then they start uh, identifying the leakages uh, painstakingly tube by tube and then weld them back or replace the one or the tube or the other. But in order to put additional tubes, it is much more difficult because you are looking at uh, supporting them inside the furnace. And in most cases, they are supported from the top. So not much really a scope. Yeah. So the flame emissivity is a function of the emissivity of the particle, emissivity of the uh, absorbing gases, which are predominantly CO2 and water vapor. So if you have more of them, emissivity increases. So radiative heat is fantastic for the radiative heat also. It will be radiating more. Absorbing more, radiating more. So this, um, uh, where the, uh, depending on, depending on uh, the flue gas recirculation, how much, how the flue gas temperature external, the flue gas exit temperatures, how it gradually changes, that's what it is shown in here. And this then also shows where the distribution of the um, heat will be, whether it will be predominant in the furnace section of the boiler, which means the burner, essentially the first pass, or horizontal through the through the through to the second pass, which is the convective section. So this is a classic way of seeing showing. You know, you can determine that in thermoflex. That in the model, if you put in, I now will change my cross-sectional area by bringing in tubes of this diameter and that diameter. You have done it. So it, Thermoflex can easily calculate for you um, that for this type of boiler, tower type or conventional type, and for this type of dimensions, how much heat will be there in the convective section, how much it will be there in the radiative section. The important, the reason I picked up this particular figure is to demonstrate that this is exactly how the, uh, all the proponents of oxyfuel system, they started making the assessments that will, the, will an existing boiler be able to give me the distribution uh, within what, whatever surfaces are available? Or are we looking at 
significantly increased heat transfer requirement in the furnace section, which will not be possible, um, or significantly under utilization of the other section, which again will not be uh, will not be preferable. Uh, so these are the sort of uh, assessments that one can make, quite routine. Uh, requires a bit of specialized knowledge about the boiler's dimension, gas velocity, uh, particle concentration, uh, gas compositions, etc. But these days, it is very well calculated. So, we um, made an assessment for a 500 megawatt uh, brown coal-fired uh, plant at the Latrobe Valley, and we used um, Thermoflex in combination with Aspen plants. So everything we generated in Thermoflex, we put all the dimensions, matched the existing boilers air fired conditions, and then we became sure that yes, our methodology is somewhat correct. You will never know whether it is exactly correct or not. Um, because you can rely on the starting documentation, the boiler manual, and based on that, you can try to match it for the air fired case. But the boiler has become old. So its heat transfer capacities have changed. But it's very, very difficult to get the uh, point, the actual information, current information on the heat transfer capacities in an old boiler. And no one keeps those sort of data. The only way that you can match, which is regularly kept, is the furnace exit gas temperature. So what goes in, what is the exit gas temperature in the, in the throat section, and of course the economizer. So between those two, you can have any combination you like. So that's where you have to sit down with the, um, the boiler operators and then tell them that, look, this is what my software is predicting, does it look realistic? So, so that's how it is done. But I thought I'll, I'll bring it in, um, in here to, um, um, to impress on you the fact that if someone wants to change a boiler with a new one or make some changes into an existing boiler, these are the sort of calculations that you will have to do. And for that, these days, actually, software is available. You don't have to do it um, from the first principles anymore. Can be done. Height, you won't be able to change much if it is an existing one. It's the internal surface area which may be possible. And the internal surface area uh, can also be provided. Um, the heat transfer area can also be increased, if you like, by changing the cooling water flow rate. That way, it, it is essentially the heat transfer, right? So, correct. So, heat transfer can be um, affected by either new areas or temperature to the terminal temperature differences or by the uh, cooling water flow rate. So all of these things are on the table. Remember, if you, are, if you say that I'll be making lots of changes, they will tell you bye-bye. So uh, somehow you will need to match that line for the existing boilers. Okay.
Hmm. Where? No, that dot dot line. No, that's the line for air firing. No recirculation there. It happens that say, at 67 percent recirculation, that carp matches with that. Yeah, and ideally, that that's the recirculation percent that you will maintain for that particular case. That's what it says. So it is here. Um, that's a very good predict. That's something the operators always keep an eye on. What else would you try to uh, maintain? Correct. Absolutely. Because you cannot go past that temperature. If you go too much past it, then you will have cold-related problems for which you may not have the experience. So you re really need to match that. Correct. So, how, how would you how would you uh, get the velocity up, even though the volumetric flow rate has gone up, uh, gone down? Reduce cost section. Yes. To some extent, you possibly can, but not much. So that's what is on a case by case, you have to do the assessment. That are, am I looking at wholesale changes, which then will not be feasible? It might be better off to demolish the boiler and then put a new one in. So that's the uh, assessment that you will have to make. First is the heat transfer matching. Then looking at, OK, in order to match the heat transfer, how much additional surface areas that we need to put so, that, so as to match the velocity. If that becomes reasonable, then go ahead. If not, then OK. No point. I don't know. I have no idea. Ideally, I mean, is the boiler designer will tell you uh, this is the dimension, this is the flame temperature that you need to monitor all the time, and that's what you will change, keep. Um, uh, so even if you consider changing from air to um, oxygen fired, then you'll still have to maintain that temperature. So that will be that will take care of the flame stability, etc. But uh, as far as what exactly is the criteria for the flame stability? I don't know. This is a book by um, Black and Witch, um, Power Station Engineering. That has those information. Long time ago, B and W, Babcock and Wilcox, used to publish a book called um, Steam, Its Generation and Use. I don't think they publish it anymore, but that was the Bible which we started reading. Our bosses gave, a, gave to us to read in the first week when we started working. And that had everything, BMW, steam and steam is generation and use. Uh, now uh, Black and Witch has another one of that type. It's a very good source book for the practicing junior engineers. Then um, the emissions bit, um, um, the, the fact is that um, 
what I have tried to make in here, uh, the, in the text, I've tried to make a point that now that you are having reducing conditions and also water vapor present, particularly reducing condition, you are actually generating away from SO2 more SO3, which is a lot more corrosive, a um, lot more acidic. So you really be, have to be mindful of that. And I haven't tried to put my own language there. I have just copied and pasted it from one of, uh, from Hartmut's uh, uh, reference. The, the graph there is, relates to NOx, and the text relates to SOx, both SO2 and SO3. So um, the graph actually does show you that um, that the in oxy case the NOx levels uh, particularly for the um, particularly for the um, uh, the dry flue gas case which is here here with um, 30% oxygen, uh, the, the NOx levels actually tend to go up uh, in case of uh, oxy-fuel firing. It's uh, simply because the, um, the compared to air firing, now potentially, unless you are careful, potentially the thermal NOx generation will be higher. So. This sort of calculations may, may take into account, uh, consider that no other changes are made. And there lies the way of um, the issue of actually staging the gas in so that these levels, which are for oxy fuel, uh, dry and wet case, they come closer to this one. So, but it's a, correct, air, air fired case. But it's a manageable problem. Because you are putting so much oxygen. So thermal, unless you distribute it properly, thermal NOx can become, and the fuel NOx can become quite large. At different levels, you can bring it. So you have different levels of burners in a boiler. In a coal-fired boiler, boiler, burners are not all in the same level. They are here, 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 here. Correct. No. If you if you put all the oxygen uh, through um, in, the, in one zone, then the temperature will be excessively high. So there is something called air staging fuel staging. Uh, in this case, it is gas staging, which will then bring it down. <laughs> temperature will be, will be you, will, you will try to keep the temperature same as before. The case of this graph is that if you are not careful, and the question that was raised that instead of bringing all in here, why don't you, I think you raised that question, that um, uh, how we uh, recycle the gas in. This is classic, one classic case. It is telling you that unless you are distributing the 67% uh, uh, recycled flue gas properly around everywhere, then you may run away with the high NOx levels. If you give, if you give, um, if you give more oxygen, then NOx will, NOx will go very high. That's precisely what is done in uh, fluidized bed combustors, uh, because the temperatures there are, are low. But more importantly, temperatures are low so that the thermal NOx, that means the air nitrogen, 
the NOx formation from that is lower. But the fuel has a certain amount of nitrogen, which generates fuel nitrogen. That is actually distributed, that is actually lowered by distributing the fuel flow, not in one location, but in different locations. Correct. Correct. So coal will be there in different burners as usual, right? The point that we are being made in here is that the flue gas that you are recycling back in, don't put it back, bring it back in only at one point. Then you will try to have a problem. You will have to distribute it. So that's an issue. That's an issue, but it's a manageable issue. Okay. No, because one of the um, problems that also happens is that, first of all, you are putting in a lot more oxygen there. So after combusting the carbon away, if there is any oxygen left, and there will be oxygen left because the excess oxygen is still the same, 2, 3, 4% as in the air-fired cases. Um, so there will be a potential for that oxygen, additional oxygen, uh, now it, that it is 32% by volume, to give you more NOx if it comes in contact with all the um, coal in one place. Because where is the additional uh, oxygen coming from? The additional oxygen, 32%, is resulting from the, uh, resulting from the uh, high purity oxygen that you are putting in. So that itself can give rise to uh, high NOx if you are not careful enough, high fuel NOx. So you need to distribute it. So that's the only point. Also distributed. No. Okay. So um, the sulfur impacts. I thought I'll um, have this one because this one's this is Terry Wall's uh, very favorite um, slide. And um, so where it impacts the sulfur in the coal in case of oxy fuel combustion? Um, right? Does it come? Kind of Okay, so here, because as we've been talking about all this reducing environment, reducing environment, what does it do? Sulfur comes in, carbon sulfide and H2S. We have been talking about that yesterday, right? Uh, that's in the uh, reduction zone where the majority of the coal is. Then you have this lagging and fouling, same as, same as in the air fire boiler. Um, then you will have uh, sulfur trioxide formation at closer to where the economizer is. It doesn't form at a very high temperature, but where the temperature is coming down at that point, that, and it is that point just before the uh, back filter on the ESP. And then, uh, so the, the net result of it is that the ESP's electrodes, they can get coated with uh, corrosive sulfur dioxide more than is the case, corrosive sulfur compounds, more than in the case of uh, the air fired one here also. And, um, and then when you are recycling, 
uh, and cooling the gas and then recycling back in, then you may have the sulfurous acid or the sulfuric acid, depending on whichever uh, is forming, if, if, uh, whether it is coming via the SO2 or coming via the SO3. So the point is that during the cooling and then subsequent recycling of it, you are building up the acidic gases, acidic vapors into the uh, location there. And then that will also affect the CO2 purity. Because when, if you, at the end of the day, the purpose of it is to produce pure CO2. Um, but we will soon see that in the maximum that you can get is to about 90%. Rest is uh, rest are different things. But that in that so-called high purity ox CO2, you are not going to materialize it because you will be recyc recycling or bringing in some of the uh, sulfur gases. They are also, uh, eventually, uh, it will um, affect the transportation line because the CO2 has to be transported, pumped to wherever you want to store the CO2 or use the CO2. So that's what it means. So let's not worry about this. You'll, this thing. So having seen where the SO3 can become an issue, what then are the mitigation option, options? So I thought I'll uh, bring that up as well, same figure as before. So here, try to put in low sulfur coal if you can, either by blending or by coal cell changing, usually by blending. Uh, then the, if you have far too much, then consider having limestone or sulfur absorber. Then, of course, this is something that we mentioned before. The soot blowing is the way to go. So maybe you have to do it more often. Consider having a sulfur scrubber there in between, a new piece of equipment. Um, and, um, and uh, so what did I do? Uh, so here also, then uh, after, after sulfur scrubber, you take the recycled gas after the sulfur scrubber rather than before the sulfur scrubber. So that's what it means. One there or one over there. Um, then have the further con condensation of the gas to take the sulfur out. Um, sulfur removal in the compression circuit. That's easier said than done. It's very, very difficult. But some people have um, proposed this. I don't know how. And then uh, uh, simply by, I think, by pressurizing it and then liquefying it and then condensing it out. But these are all expensive solutions. So the, um, about the CO2 purity, uh, the point that we try to make it is obviously the uh, whole idea was that you will get 95, 97% CO2 purity. But the fact is that um, uh, there are other non-condensable gases, a fair bit of that. And one is the argon. Not that it's a big issue, but then you, uh, people have considered at that point uh, to have separation of the argon from in that manner. But the fact is that once you have condensed, you are looking at about, uh, looking at about achievable purity, maximum is this. So this is the bottom line, as simple as that. So here, uh, what I've done is I've taken, again, a figure, um, which the authors took it from Cather, Terry took it from the Cather uh, in the, for a simple scheme. How eventually the, um, the um, CO2 concentration comes down to about 90%. This is, this is how it, uh, this is where you get uh, close to 90%. The remaining are all these gases. And um, 
sometimes you know um, they um, try to compress the CO2 and cooling it down further in here, taking some of the CO2 out together with concentrated streams of the other gases to achieve high degree of high concentration of 98% CO2. But then the bottom, uh, the penalty is that you'll be losing some of this uh, to somewhere else. So the, where it came from is the, from the geological storage point of view, um, or the enhanced oil recovery point of view, they said that, look, 89% is not good enough. We need closer to 100% or thereabouts. It's the only way that they, they can do if you have another conditioning cooling unit, deep cooling unit in here by taking a slipstream and thereby increasing the concentration here and doing it better. So these are all concepts that people have tried to come up with, but not really practiced. Uh, it all, uh, the whole, the um, storage people are also quite uh, conservative. They would, would not allow you to store anything that you can put in. And it is, it's quite interesting to see this dot, 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 dot which basically means there are a lot of other things, the trace gases, which no one knows or no one tries to know. So, so it's an interesting story. First of all, our uh, pressure is uh, about 165 bar. It's a huge amount. And significant. You have to liquefy it. So it's not amb ambient. It's not ambient temperature. I mean, I mean, th theoretically, it's multi-stage compression. Yeah, multi compression. So these compressors are very impressive. Yeah. So that's what uh, Dr. Davi was telling day before yesterday, that. Um, in order to capture the CO2 and then store it, you now have to build, generate more power, consume more coal. Because at the end, end of the day, you and I and everyone needs this much electricity anyway. So if that, some of that electricity is taken away. Oh, yes, yeah, not a single state. Yeah. Yeah. But overall, it you know it reduces about ten percentage point, and no one, no one, uh, no thirty percent drop. So ten percentage point. If it was only ten percent drop, people will be very happily going home. But it's a significant amount, and no amount of. And the other side of the coin is that, um, that uh, why this started at the beginning is that you are not looking at the means. Uh, as you need in the post-combustion capture, you will be needing the, all the different types of means. Every company has its own formulation, etc. But after you have regenerated the means, you, have not been, you will not be able to regenerate it 100% you'll be regenerating on the vaporization loss. And then the waste amine that will remain, that's a hodgepodge of everything. Because in that amine are all these dot, dot, dots. So what do you do with that amine? And EPA is not going to allow you to put it in, your, in a bucket in your garden. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's it. That will be interesting. So I thought we'll, uh, let's um, have a little bit of 
uh, information on that, but this is really, if you are getting it, um, this is also a literature figure. Whether day in, day out, that is achievable. That's cool. 90%. CO2 purity. Pumping, pumping a high temperature gas, very power intensive. You're a chemical engineer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Before, above, just above the dew point. Which means you need to know what is there, uh, what acid gases are there, and what concentration. If you can condense, um, uh, if you can. Uh, to to tolerate a heat exchanger that which will allow you to condense and then uh, again it will be an economics. Yes, that's right. But that's again, right. Further cooling is also cost. Further cooling is also cost. Cooling water is only for certain temperature. Certain temperature. Then, uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, correct. So you are you are requiring a very um, cold fluid to do that cooling. So the, if you can recall the first, um, first in the, one of the pre first series of slides, we talked about these five different areas of five major issues. So that's brought back here in the first column. And um, what's the um, issue in, against each of those? And what impact does it have? And what can be done? The last column is what can be done with those to tackle those issues. There is something that cannot be done anything with, uh, with this one, but it's good to know that here is a concentrated source of argon available. If someone is willing to put in effort, can get not free argon, but you know. And then um, the metal corrosion, uh, of course, um, um, of course, um, uh, the, sulf the presence of the sulfur trioxide gas can uh, add, does add a new dimension of producing sulfuric acid in addition to sulfurous, which is normally comes from the hydrogen, uh, sorry, the sulfur dioxide. And uh, people have actually therefore done tests in the laboratory using that type of test rig by inserting temp um, gases um, um, and uh, subjecting them to control temperature, all sorts of uh, all sorts of um, uh, conditions, uh, and exposing them to certain number of hours, and then seeing how the surface gets corroded, because this is a very good design information that can flow from the research institutions from these well-controlled experiments. And then you can decide that, OK, I will be using either a different kind of material, or I will not allow the gases to come in contact uh, for that long before if by 10 hour, if by 10 hour it becomes very, very significant, the problem, then I will um, clean it up after four or five hours. So these are some of the information that can come out from the very well-focused experimental work, usually carried out by the universities. And then the mercury. Um, the lot of the heat exchangers are actually for cheapness's sake, uh, inexpensiveness's sake, are aluminum heat exchanger. Because as soon as you start doing the CO2 capture business, then uh, everything becomes so expensive. So you are looking at cost saving here, cost saving there. And then, so the, um, the aluminum heat exchangers, before people realized the, that mercury can become a problem, 
because mercury is usually uh, an oxidized form of mercury in air fired boilers, so it's not a problem. It's all captured by the ESP predominantly if the ESP is uh, working well. Um, but no one realized until they started taking measurement that the mercury is now coming out as elemental mercury. So if they started playing havoc with the um, aluminum heat exchangers. So there are um, different ways that the mercury uh, eats up the aluminum tubes uh, through amalgam forming amal uh, amalgams um, and brittles the um, the um, the aluminum tubes. And so, as far as the issues in oxyfuel is concerned, uh, the lot of effort is actually put in um, identifying. Uh, in what form the mercury is present in the coal in the first place, which is fine, but then in what form does it come out? The partitioning into elemental versus plus two form. Knowing it very well, say 20 years ago, ac accurate mercury analyzers did not exist, exist. There was a time in the Illinois basin in the US when the it's around the Illinois Basin, the Illinois River, there are all sorts of power stations. And then there was a time when the doctors advised pregnant mums not to take any fish from the Illinois River during their pregnancy period because the fish was taking, uh, ingesting so much of mercury. But the fact is then back those days, so 30 years ago, the uh, accurate measurement of mercury from the gas phase was, did not exist. And the DOE pumped in a lot of money. And now you can buy mercury analyzers. Um, stage. So coming from a problem, uh, you know, uh, very well targeted and patient research effort come, came the solution. So things are possible. So anyway, so this is what is needed. Uh, true, true, very true. Because it's a reducing environment. But the other point that we make is the natural gas industry reduces the elementary market to very little bit. So many market, microgram per normal meter cube. So it's possible the technology is there. Um, as I mentioned, maybe day two, that uh, Eastman Kodak uh, developed the technology with their activated carbon bed to get rid of the, adsorb the elemental mercury on the activated carbon bed. In fact, the, uh, a lot of the mercury contaminated soils are treated that way. Taking it to high temperature, release the elemental mercury and pass it through activated carbon bed in a very, through a very close chamber. I have seen plants in operation. I mean, it's in Dandin. I mean, not very far from where Monash is, about 30 kilometers maybe. So, this is available these days. And then the last two slides, let me uh, take it to you. Yeah. So, here, um, uh, what it is, is that uh, what the, we have talked about the mercury's impacts. So what are the remedies? The remedies are, uh, of course, one is selectively, you catalytically um, reduce it. The air preheater region um, here, you reduce it. Or here, uh, you convert it to particulate uh, mercury rather than allowing it to go in completely in the vapor phase and then capture it here because this would to some extent is like a carbon bed, the ESP or the back filter. So if you can design it properly, then you can actually calculate, uh, sorry, not calculate, uh, remove it in here, and then ultimately how you do it, how you, where you dispose it, that's a different thing. At least from the plant, it is removed, it's not going here. Oxidized mercury is not a problem. And then the last bit, 
the, um, what's the extent of the mercury removal. This figure is almost, I would say, six, seven year, years old. There is a lot of uh, development in the mercury field has taken place, phenomenal and very good developments. So uh, I thought I will have it from the IEA report, IEA clinical centers report, this table for your information, that if, if my coal is bituminous or subbituminous or lignite, these are the round figures. By no means these are exactly definitive, but this is good to, um, good to know. Important thing is these two, see, fabric filter or the back, back filter or the ESP together with the weight FGD can reduce it by about 95% in this case. The problem is with the lignite, some of the lignites, the, the mercury association is such that it doesn't go into the vapor phase, it just stays with the solids. but. Um, and therefore, they are very, very difficult to remove, but not necessarily for all lignites. Our lignites, for, uh, brown coal, for example, very little uh, mercury is there. Even though over a period of 30, 35, 40, 50 years, it will all build up, but it can be ca captured. The, ma the major effort is still like um, try to oxidize it, as long as you know where it has come from try to oxidize it, and then you will not have that problem. Correct. The, uh, doing it, doing this at the, uh, after the 260 degrees, the problem is that then you will have to increase the temperature again. So if you are, can do it up front where it is where the temperature is higher, if you can oxidize it somehow there, that's the best. So there's a whole lot of, I'm, I'm, I mean, I have not even bothered to go into it. There's a whole lot of uh, literature available exclusively for converting the elemental mercury to oxidized form of mercury in presence of other gases. The thing is, it's not just present by itself, which would have made life easier, but it's present with other uh, compounds. So that's basically it uh, for the oxy fuel. We, uh, I will, after lunch, I will go to oxy CFB. But I will look after immediately after a little bit of fundamentals, I'll start focusing on the problem areas similar in the same year. Um, yeah. and, um, and with the oxy CFB, in case I forget, because I did not put it in my slide, last night when I made it. Uh, there is a report written by me and Terry Wall on Oxy CFB's um, status. It's about five years old now. It's publicly available. So you may read that. We try to make it uh, as uh, attractive as is possible to a wider audience.